Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. My name is Amy Scott, and I'm the Head of Organisational Development at Erwin Mitchell. A key part of my role is leading on cultural development of our organisation, which includes many things, one of them being our wellbeing strategy. And for us at Erwin Mitchell, wellbeing is about a number of things, really. It's about proactively promoting and supporting the wellbeing of our colleagues. It's about improving resilience and it's about maintaining good psychological health. And all of those things are really essential for sustainability and positive performance. And over recent months, we've taken a really purposefully focused approach on psychological health working in partnership with Dr Brian Marion and his team at the Positive Group who are real experts and an absolute pleasure to work with. So I'm delighted today to be joined by Brian who's going to share with us some really fascinating insights on how organisations and leaders can improve psychological health, engagement and performance through times of uncertainty and disruption. So I think that's a topic that's relevant to all of us right now. So what, before I hand over to Brian, just one more point from me to add. We will be taking uh, questions during and at the end of the session. So please do feel free to use the Q&A function at the side and we'll get to as many of those as we possibly can. So without further ado, Brian, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, I'm just going to bring up my uh, brief PowerPoint just to make a few points a bit more easy to see. OK, well, thank you. Thank you, Amy, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I think um, we're really enjoying our working partnership with uh, Erwin Mitchell. We're talking today about psychological health, and uh, it's, it's something that's very close to my heart. Uh, I'm actually a, a medic. I'm a doctor of medicine, uh, but I'm also a psychologist, and I wrote my thesis many years ago on burnout in doctors. And ever since then, uh, along with some colleagues, very good close colleagues, uh, we started to recognise that there were risk factors and protective factors that influence people's trajectory, uh, just as they do in physical disease. And we also became increasingly aware that psychological health really matters. And the reason I mention that is that when I went through medical school and certainly as a youngster, we weren't educated about this area. We had medicine and we had psychiatry. And I think to Amy's point is that we need to think about prevention as well as treatment. And I, we're going to focus today on a little bit of the science, but also understanding what are the risk factors? What are the things that can make people more likely to develop enduring psychological problems and what are the protective factors what are the things that you can do and i think this is a really key message so um, what we know is that that currently we're facing uh, a perfect storm in lots and lots of ways um, one of the reasons for that is that it's creating a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity and if you look at pre-covid Pre-COVID, the, the prevalence of psychological problems in the normal working population was about one in six. So about 15% of us were experiencing a significant psychological problem. And the commonest of those is stress, anxiety or depression. Now, we can all move into that space, as we'll touch on in a bit more detail. But <clears throat> and often we go into that space and then we recover. But as we're going to talk about, the problem is that that space, that feeling distressed or uh, depressed or anxious is quite a sticky place. It, you can get stuck there and we should be educating people in how to recover their equilibrium. Now, the reason this is important, particularly now, and I think this has pushed uh, psychological health up the agenda, the current data coming from the Office for National Statistics and from UCL here in London, but also from the Census Bureau in America and the Kaiser Family Foundation, they're pretty consistent that the prevalence has gone up from one in six to one in three. Um, now, that actually isn't too surprising because what the pandemic has done is created huge uncertainty. And for some people, it's created incredible distress and suffering. For some of us, I mean, there's a, a blog recently that said we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. 
some of us are sitting in super yachts and some of us are in little dinghies and some of us don't even have a boat. So I think its impact is very unique and different for a whole range of reasons because of our job, because of our finances, where we live, but also our family, our health and the health of our people around us. So I think this is a complex process and we need to understand it as a complex and dynamic process. But I think tolerance of uncertainty is powerfully correlated to distress. And one of the reasons that people don't like the pandemic is we don't know what's happening. We don't know what's going to happen. And the reason I mention this is that tolerance of uncertainty and tolerance of ambiguity have both been correlated to success in organisations when leadership have a good tolerance of ambiguity and a tolerance of uncertainty. I received a paper from America just a couple of weeks ago <clears throat> looking at tolerance of ambiguity in young junior doctors. And it's highly predictive. Low tolerance of ambiguity is highly predictive of developing stress and burnout. So one of the things we should be helping people is to build a greater tolerance of uncertainty. Now, the good news is you can do that. And there are very good randomized control trials and meta analyses looking at how you can help people build tolerance of uncertainty. Now, I can remember from my own my own uh, childhood and uh, younger life. Um, I can remember, you know, changing school and worrying, you know, will I fit in? Will it be OK? What's going to happen? <clears throat> so what happens when there's uncertainty is we tend to activate our, our sort of video on fast forward and start what ifing. When you start what if you can start to feel anxious. And I remember moving from medical school into junior hospital jobs as a junior doctor and working as a, in paediatrics as a SHO and thinking, you know, uh, will I be able to get a drip up on a baby? Will I be able to do a lumbar puncture? Will I be able to intubate? And just thinking about those things could make me feel anxious and worried. So I think this is a really important dynamic is understanding it. And some psychologists argue that tolerance of uncertainty and tolerance of ambiguity sit underneath all anxiety conditions. So I'd like to just talk about this continuum that, that we all move along. And there are days when we're flourishing. There are days when we feel good, we feel, we feel energized and we feel connected. And this is a really good space to be. But what I want to emphasize is that it impacts on your cognition. It impacts on your cognitive function. Now, it's very easy to measure cognitive function and you can measure things like uh, concentration, memory, decision making, executive skills, and they tend to be the best when we're feeling good. And interestingly, you you can access all areas of your brain when you're in this space. You also, and I think this is important, tend to be more, much more pro-social. Your empathy circuits are on. You can connect with other human beings. You become more collaborative, collegiate, you connect and it feels good. So it's affecting how you think, but it's also affecting how you feel. Now we could talk for many hours about the physiological impact of your mood state. We know that good mental health correlates with good physical health. We know that any decrement in psychological health impacts on your physical health. And there's big areas of medicine now that look at this around what's called psychoneuroimmunology or psychoneuroendocrinology, affecting hormone levels. In fact, we now know that your psychological state has tentacles into every aspect of your being, every single bit, every organ, every tissue, every cell. And it actually impacts on your DNA. Uh, this is what's called an epigenetic effect, which explains why a lot of factors influence our health and our well-being. But I just want to mention behaviour. When we're flourishing, we tend to, when I did my research on burnout, and this is replicated many, many times, is that when, when doctors feel good, the milk of human kindness flows. When doctors start to get stressed and particularly burnt out, they make more clinical errors. They make more prescribing errors, but they have a massive uptick in patient complaints, mainly because they treat patients with a degree of scepticism or cynicism, which they don't do when they're feeling well. So the milk of human kindness actually curdles. And this is because we have less bandwidth. We have less capacity to tune into how other people are feeling and have those really good, meaningful conversations that care 
and show reciprocity and interest in our fellow man and woman. So where you sit on this continuum has huge implications. And once as an organization, you've recruited bright, competent, capable, intelligent people, which organizations go to great lengths to do, the best predictor, bar none, of how they perform is where they sit on this continuum. And that's a really interesting process. I just want to talk very briefly about the mind and imagination. Now, imagination is probably the reason that human beings have made the extraordinary transition from a relatively unimportant primate to being all over the world and doing extraordinary things like putting men on the moon or just a few weeks ago, uh, putting an airship onto, uh, onto Mars. The reason we can do this is that we can use our imagination to time travel. We can what if, what if we did this? What if we did that? This becomes a very exciting process and it creates creativity, innovation, ideas, and actually most great ideas come from people having great imagination. In fact, Einstein talked about what he called Gedanken experiments, where he imagined himself traveling on a beam of light to work out the theory of relativity. This is an amazing gift, an extraordinary gift. But the flip side of it is that it's also a curse because we can use the same equipment, the same software, if you like, to imagine terrible, frightening things. And this is what's called functional equivalence. And this is why Milton said in Paradise Lost, the mind can make a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven. And we should be educating our youngsters, but also all of us about how do you manage your mind? How do you understand the risk factors and the protective factors? How do you modify so you don't actually increase your chances of developing psychological problems. So to Amy's point, <clears throat> more about prevention than treatment, but there are some fantastic tools, cognitive tools, behavioral tools, social tools that are incredibly effective in this area. So we're going to touch on some of those in a moment, but before we do, I'd just like to sort of join things up. Now, this is what we call the core model. Some people call it an integrative model. And it sits very proudly, actually, in, in cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience, because what it does is it joins up bits of us. It joins up cognition. In this context, that's thoughts and emotions. Sorry, thoughts and thoughts and images. Emotion, how we're feeling, moods and emotions. Physiology, what's going on inside your body. Behavior, but also your central chemistry. And this whole matrix changes depending on the context and the environment we find ourselves in. So let me just try and bring this alive. If I if I start thinking about, uh, or if I turn my phone on and a picture of one of my grandchildren comes up on the screen, that image actually will change my brain chemistry within about 11 milliseconds. It activates my parasympathetic nervous system. I get physiological changes. My blood pressure, pulse rate, muscle tension may drop. I start to feel at peace with the world. That actually influences how I'm feeling and how I'm behaving. And if something, you know, if my wife pops in and says, would you like a coffee? I say, hi, how are you doing? What's going on? But if I have a, a thought or an image of somebody I don't like, that thought or image can change my brain chemistry in 11 milliseconds. It changes my physiology in 150 milliseconds. So let me give you an example to bring it alive. Let's say I'm at home on my own and I'm watching, uh, I go to bed and I wake up in the night and there's a noise. If I'm feeling com content and, and happy in my home, my thought may be that's my Labrador. I do have a Labrador, so it's not a deluded thought. That thought or image actually has very little impact on my central chemistry. I might push up a bit of dopamine and oxytocin because I love my Labrador. Um, there's no big emotional shift, very little physiological change, and my behavior is to contentedly pull up the duvet and go back to sleep. But let's say I watched Psycho before I went to bed, so I was feeling a bit stressed. Or let's say a neighbor told me there'd been a break-in down the road a few nights before. I now wake, I hear exactly the same noise but I'm a bit stressed, I'm a bit anxious. I now think there's someone in my home. That thought, particularly if it's an image of an intruder, will change my brain chemistry in 11 milliseconds. But within 150 milliseconds, I've now got a thumping heart, dry mouth, sweaty palms, based on a cognition. 
and my behaviour is not to pull up the duvet and go back to sleep. I am wired to the moon. I cannot focus on anything. I certainly can't go back to sleep. And then I start catastrophizing who it might be, a gang of drug crazed youths, uh, a psychopath who's es escaped from a local hospital and he's going to chop me up into little bits. These distorted, irrational, catastrophic thoughts then make me feel more anxious. But feeling more anxious makes me have more catastrophic thoughts. And this is called cognitive emotional fusion or rumination. And it's it's a key feature in psychological distress and it's a maintaining factor in psychological distress. Now understanding these mechanisms informs solutions. So we actually think that and we know from very good research now that psychological education in and of itself is protective and that's been shown again on randomized control trials and meta-analysis. So understanding and normalizing is incredibly powerful. And I just want to touch on this other area that comes away from the individual. And Amy and Irma Mitchell are looking at this in great detail. No man or woman is an island. We are connected to other people. And the quality of that connection has an amazing impact on our health. Good quality relationships, both in our home, with our friends, with our family, but also at work, have a huge impact on our psychological health. And they also have an impact on our physical health. And they also have an impact on our longevity. And we know that loneliness is stonkingly bad for our health and will abbreviate your life by sort of 10 to 20 years. And what's really concerning, I think, about COVID is we're seeing a particularly big uptick in psychological problems, which was happening pre-COVID, but in young people between sort of 10 and 24. Now, <clears throat> that's understandable because that's a very important time to be socialising with your peers and young adults actually really want to connect with their peers. So not being able to do that would explain that. But the incidence or prevalence of psychological problems in young people was going up pre-COVID. And the reason this is so important is that uh, and this is a really concerning a uh, piece of research, but it's it's very, very robust, which is that if you develop a psychological problem between the age of 10 and 24, a significant uh, level of, of, of mental illness, that predicts 75% of all adult mental illness. So we should be really striving hard to help people cope with that transition from childhood to adulthood with adolescence, which can be so confusing and with some of the thoughts and, and problems that they have during that period. And I think I'm not suggesting for a second we can eliminate psychological problems, but I'm absolutely convinced you can modify them, mitigate them and ameliorate them. But social support, I mean, if you'd asked me five years ago, what did I think was the most important thing? I'd have talked about cognition or behaviours. Now, the thing that I think is the most important thing for people's mental health is the quality of their relationships. Uh, and the people we work with and live with and connect with. Because people forget what you said, they forget what you did, but they never forget how you made them feel. Emotions encode data, and we know this because if youngsters get excluded or bullied at school <coughs> severely, then that increases their risk of depression fivefold. And we remember rejection, we, we remember how people treat us. Both the people who were good to us but the people who weren't good to us. And this needs to be applied into the work setting because it can have a devastating legacy for people in, in the workplace. And we know that the biggest factor that predicts people leaving an organisation is the quality of their relationship with their line manager and the culture in the organisation and how people talk to each other, what we do around here. Those cultural display rules are absolutely key. And what's fascinating is it's contagious it cascades through the group. This is called social network theory, but here you have high support from senior leadership creates good colleague support across the organisation. So if leadership are supportive, collegiate, collaborative, then actually colleagues tend to do the same. It becomes a social norm, it becomes a cultural display rule. But if senior leadership demonstrate low levels of collegiality, collaboration, support, then that actually plays out across the business. Now this has huge implications for how businesses work. 
And the interesting thing is it also relates to well-being. So if you have leadership who are actually supportive, collaborative, collegiate, that actually impacts on the psychological health of people across the organisation. And you see this in families, you see this in communities. It makes a huge difference to our psychological health and our well-being and our quality of life. So just to sort of finish on this, I think um, I think understanding one's emotions, understanding moods and how they influence how we think, feel and behave, understanding that the threat circuit is the biggest and most powerful neurological circuit in your brain and body. It hijacks everything. Now, it doesn't really matter whether the threat is real or imagined. So if I imagine there's an intruder in my house, I activate 90 percent of the neurons that are activated when there is an intruder in my house. So this virtual reality in our head actually can be a cause of threat and anxiety because we worry and we ruminate about things going wrong. We have what's called anticipatory threat. We think about all the things that could go wrong. And this is actually predicts developing psychological problems. So helping people mitigate that self-engendered threat circuit is really important. Now, the hedonic circuit is great and I'm not knocking it, but we need to, we need to have things to work for, to strive for, to achieve. It's a fantastic process but it doesn't give you life satisfaction and it doesn't mitigate distress. What it does is it gives you a transient blip because we, we like it, it feels good, uh, and it squirts out a bit of dopamine. But what's fascinating is that when you get your A-levels and get into university or get your degree or get promoted at work or get married or whatever, it does improve our mood state, but very transiently. And this is called hedonic adaptation. Whereas the negativity bias, which is the threat state, we are obsessed with the negative, and you can see that with our media every day. This bottom bit of the pie chart is key, and I think organisations that get their head around this are going to actually future-proof themselves. What we need to do is build collaborative, collegiate, cohesive groups, and that's highly protective. If you look at the research on this, it reduces stress. It's, it's the best predictor of reducing PTSD in, in uh, army personnel. It's fantastically protected. It also reduces pain. Lots of studies showing that when you have good social support, your pain tolerance increases. This is a neurobiological process, and we can, as human beings, decide to decide to create environments that are cooperative and supportive. If we do, as we saw a moment ago, it cascades through the group. And that's a really good process. So I think just to finish on this, I think you need to develop targeted processes that address individuals. Because sometimes the individual is doing some things that can be compounding or maintaining a problem and understanding that that psychological education can be incredibly liberating. I think we need to do things about teams, how we connect, how what we value, how people talk to each other, how we cooperate. And then the third bit is the culture what we do around here. And that culture is actually, and none of these are independent. They're all influencing each other. And then outside of this, you have the environment. So you have the pandemic, you have the uncertainty, you have the worries, you have issues about, do I get vaccinated or don't I get vaccinated? All sorts of things are happening in our environment that actually start to ripple through groups. But I think if people address all three of these levels, it can start to make a significant difference. And I just finished by emphasizing this. If you look at individual learning against social learning, there was a great paper by a chap called Professor Beer in the Harvard Business Review a few years ago called The Great Training Robbery. And he outlined how 99% of all CPD L&D actually has no lasting benefit. And the reason for that is that if the culture or the environment in which you live and work isn't supporting it, it doesn't get done. And social learning, and this is Sandy Pentland's work at MIT, demonstrates that social learning is five times more powerful. So with Amy, we're talking about how do we take this knowledge and get it into the water? How can it become what we do around here? Rather than just being what we call declarative knowledge, that we know it, what do you do with it 
to get it into the DNA. And I think that's a really big challenge. And it's something that I think organizations are beginning to really think about to create sustainable learning that lasts. I'm going to stop there and hand back to Amy. I'll just stop sharing with you. Brilliant. Thank you, Brilliant. So, as you know, we're going to have a conversation about the, um, you know, the increased focus on psychological well-being. Brilliant. Um, the increased focus on psychological well-being of our colleagues, and and specifically what organisations and what we're doing actually at Owen Mitchell to support that, particularly in a post-COVID, slightly disrupted, evolving world. I think it would be fair to say. But before we do that. If we just take a step into the past for a second, in your experience, Brian, how much focus was given to psychological health pre-pandemic and, and what were the kind of issues that organisations were facing? Well, I think this is fascinating. I mean, I, I worked in the NHS for 30 years. And as I mentioned, I wrote my thesis on burnout in doctors. And then I was asked to set up a clinical service in the National Health Service for doctors and health healthcare professionals. And, and we're only talking, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and I led that uh, organisation, that clinical service for, for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. What was fascinating was that people were so reluctant to come and talk about it mm -hmm. because in, in those days, uh, and it wasn't that long ago, um, there was a there was a sort of denial, but there was also a bit of phobia, emotional phobia. So there was a concept that if you talked about it, you'd make it worse. And if you talked about it, you would incur some degree of shame or stigma uh, from your peer group. So people actually didn't talk about it. They didn't volunteer it because this was a cultural display rule. I think the, the sense was that you waited till somebody got ill and then you benignly retired them uh, and they would go away quietly and you'd say, well, they decided to, you know, spend more time with their family or some other euphemism. So we were phobic about this. I think what was happening pre-COVID, which was fascinating, is that it's moving up the business agenda. It's we're, we're much more aware. I think that was triggered by some economics, by absenteeism and the costs to organisations, which are really hard metrics. And then on the back of absenteeism came presenteeism which was costing six to ten times as much as absenteeism, where people pitch up for work, but they're psychologically not well. And then people started to think, wow. And, and lots of people have researched the cost benefit of doing good interventions from Deloitte to others who who demonstrated the return on investment. So I think it was really moving up the agenda. But as you mentioned at the outset, I think the focus was more on illness than prevention. And I think we need to have both. It's not either or, it's both and. So we have upstream and downstream intervention. But what about a question to you? What, what, um, what happened for you at Owen Mitchell to put psychological health so firmly on the radar that you decided to, to do something about it? I think probably one of the, the, the most important points to make is that it is relevant to everyone, right? We're, we're human beings and going back to one of your first slides, Brian, you know, we're all going to take a journey through that continuum that you described. So we are all most definitely going to be feeling periods of a little bit overwhelmed, a little bit anxious. And I think it's fair to say that the pandemic has created many opportunities for us to, to feel that way. So. For us, it was a real recognition that this has relevance to everybody. Um, and of course, the pandemic really shone a spotlight um, for some of our colleagues in, in particular. Um, and just to build on a point that you mentioned there, we, we for some time have had a focus on wellbeing at Irwin Mitchell. And I would describe our previous focus to be around the cures that you described. So, yeah, we have we've got an awesome team of healthy mind advocates in the organisation. We've got a brilliant set of resources. So when people are having a, a moment of crisis and they need some support, we've got that. And that remains. But we take we took a very conscious decision, actually, to move to that preventative approach, because let's take it to a really personal level. You know, if, if I'm feeling good, the decisions that I make, how I communicate, my behaviour, I bring my A game, right? So we, we want all of our colleagues across the organisation to be able to flourish and to bring their A game. 
And it's yeah. really important that we're they're all we're all healthy to enable that to happen. So, and like you say, you know, there's a very, very clear link between well-being, psychological health, engagement and performance. And I think we'll talk later on about how important it is to make that connection as an organisation so that this isn't something that sits in isolation. This is truly part of, again, to quote yourself, Brian, you know, it's part of our how we do things around here. It's part of our DNA at Owen Mitchell. And I think the other point that I know we've spoken about uh, quite often is this is a life skill. OK, so, yes, this is really important for our colleagues and our leaders to be the best version of themselves. But actually, it's important as a as a partner, as a friend, as a daughter, as a son. All these roles that we play in life, this has a real impact. So so that was why you know it came onto our radar for sure. So, so looking ahead then, uh, Brian, when the path ahead is, you know, as it might be at the moment, a little uncertain, I think we probably all kind of recognise that we sometimes turn to our leaders, we often turn to our leaders to gain a little bit of clarity or to perhaps look for a little bit of hope. What's your view on the role that leaders play in a crisis and actually, you know, the, the shadow that they cast? Uh, I mean, I, I, I... It's huge. I don't think it can be overstated, actually. And and I think uh, what, what interests me working with a lot of leadership teams is that a lot of leaders are unaware of how important they are, not in a sort of egocentric way, but how people are watching them, listening to them. And I, I often say to leaders, you know, you cannot not communicate. And even when you're not communicating, you're communicating. And what are you communicating? And Interesting, there was a big meta-analysis looking at leaders who have high tolerance of uncertainty. Their organisations are more financially successful than, organize, than leadership who has a low tolerance of uncertainty. Now, I think the reason for that is that the story the leader is telling himself or herself when they have low tolerance of uncertainty is, oh my God, this is awful. Uh, we're all going to hell in a handcart. This is a disaster. What's going to happen? If you're telling yourself that story, you tend to leak that in your conversations, in your body language, in your tonality, in your facial expression. And other people are absolutely designed to pick that up. And what then you do is you tell them stories, either through your body language or tonality, or directly, which then spooks them. So this is the contagion. This is the cascade. So that's one issue. But I think there's another really big issue here is is about what's valued and rewarded. So we did some work with a very large um, accountancy firm and we asked this group of partners in, the, in, in this firm, um, did they feel that um, sort of leadership and leadership values were important and valued? They all came back and said yes. Absolutely, hugely. We then asked them if they were rewarded. They weren't even measured. And if you don't measure them, you can't reward them. And I think this is really important because if you're working in an organization, just because somebody says we value this doesn't mean it's valued. You have to demonstrate that it's valued in what you do around here, but also in how you reward people for doing it. And in most professions, we reward technical skills, and we reward people in business who bring in money to their cost centers, which is great. But we don't actually value and measure this in the same way. And I think until we do, it has to be. And I think this goes back to leadership. I think they they have to say this is important. So they value it. They have to walk the talk as well as talking the talk. And I think this is sometimes called operant conditioning, where you reward the good behavior. And there are some organizations we're working with now who reward people for their technical skills, but they actually augment their, their bonuses or their income if they are running a good team. So let me just ask you a question. What, what are the sort of problems and challenges your leadership have been experiencing? What, what have you noticed amongst uh, yourself and your colleagues at the top of the organization? Actually, Brian, which maybe brings it to life. I, I remember, you know, when I 
first became a mum 14 years ago and I had visions that this would be a really idyllic time in my life and um, it would all come beautifully naturally to me and of course it didn't like it doesn't to, to, to many first time mums um, and I was putting all of my focus on on my baby on my son Sam and I wasn't putting any attention on myself at all it was all about the baby and the reason that I share that story is because I think some leaders can can face that similar similar scenario because as a leader we want to be able to support our people right and we want to support our people to be happy and engaged and the best version of themselves like like I've mentioned yeah mm. so that has been a very real challenge for our leaders because mm. one of the fir first messages that we've been really clear on is self-care is critically important okay so so for us as a, as a leadership team, we've really, really um, underlined the importance of our leadership teams understanding more about psychological health. So the science that sits behind it, so understanding the rationale and then being able to acknowledge their level of psychological health, where they are on that continuum and actually help them develop some tools and techniques to manage that and come back to that equilibrium. So that that's the first challenge that I would say, um, because sometimes it feels a little bit um, unnatural to put ourselves first as leaders, but actually it's critically important in this in this scenario as we found. And then I think I think the second thing is is the not knowing, right? And it goes back to that point that you make about uncertainty. Um, some leaders, it could be said, feel that they need to know everything. And I think many of us on this call would recognise that that's, that's not necessarily the case. But when it comes to a topic like psychological health, which from the outside feels complex, it feels very new mm -hmm. um, and it brings with it a level of responsibility. That, that can sometimes incite feelings of anxiety from a leadership perspective. Mm -hmm. So, so what we have done is we've really taken our time to create learning experiences where leaders can share. And going back to one of your previous slides around the importance of social learning. So we've put a, you know, a real emphasis on creating communities across our leadership population. And that meant that they've experienced learning together. We've set up buddying systems, for example, that they can choose to engage with and, and some more than others. And that's OK. That, that's absolutely a choice. But what that creates is, again, it's going back to one of your points around quality relationships. We've created and enabled that space for quality relationships across our leadership teams to learn together, to experience together. Mm -hmm. So that actually if our leaders are facing some challenges, there's a safe environment for them to talk about it. And I think we probably all recognise if we feel that we're the only person having that issue. So Amy becoming a mum 14 years ago thought that I was the only mum that was feeling those feelings. <laughs> and as soon as I picked up the phone to my health visitor and she said, this is perfectly normal. Brilliant. That, that you know, that made me feel better. So, yeah, they they are definitely some of the challenges that our, our leaders have faced and how we're supporting them. And it's probably touches on trust quite a lot. Brian, I think we've both mentioned that word. Um, it comes up a lot when we talk about psychological well-being. How do you think that that impacts, you know, how people feel or how they deal with volatility? I, I think it's huge. I, I think trust is is the sort of currency of performance i think it's been called i think i think when when groups of people have a sense of trust and reciprocity reciprocity is really important in in relationships that um we care for each other and that actually creates this sense well i'll look after you too uh, and there's an old african proverb that says trust arrives on foot and leaves on horseback it's difficult to build and some people actually require a lot of um evidence before they'll trust you other people require less but it absolutely is key to performance and i think organizations that create cooperative collegiate supportive groups uh, with intelligent kindness and i mean intelligent kindness not not just helping everybody because sometimes when you help everybody with everything you can de-skill them so it's an intelligent kindness that is helping them become the best they can be and i think what we know from from 
mass 30, 40, 50 years of research is that social support buffers us against stress. And that doesn't matter where you live in the world, what culture you come from. And also when you start to get trusting relationships, people perform optimally. And so I think it's absolutely key. And I think interestingly, organizations have got such a intense focus on individuals. They don't think about how people are relating to each other. That I think is going to be key to success in the future. Back to that point that you made about intelligent kindness, it links into coaching, doesn't it? You know, so Absolutely. Really Absolutely. clear link to coaching, which which is a key attribute for any any great leader. So that importance of making sure that well-being and psychological health is, is genuinely connected yep. is, is really important, shouldn't be lost. Yeah. So what about you at Erwin Mitchell? Um, you know, do you do you see the um, think that that mistakes have been made and do you think if so what what mistakes do you think will be uh, made and perpetuated yeah so before i answer that question we have a great comment come in um trust is from jim so thank you jim for this he says that trust is the one thing that changes everything so i couldn't couldn't agree more with that jim yeah um yeah and actually that that trust thing is, is absolutely important i think sometimes be underestimated uh, the impact that, that, that trust can have. So the mistakes, then, well, OK, it's an interesting question, isn't it? So we're all going to make mistakes with human beings. And um, even those of us that like to get things right all of the time, I think, have to admit that any learning journey that individuals or organisations go on, there are going to be things that you look back and you think, OK, could have done that differently or could have done that better. So I'm just going to reframe the question ever so slightly. Um, because as I was thinking about this, it's it's more around the things that we're going to keep really focused on at Erwin Mitchell. And that is around making sure that this is not a tick box exercise. And we've spoken about this before. So, mm. yes, we are doing a lot of work around creating a bench strength, you know, that baseline knowledge of awareness. Um, we've doing some brilliant work with yourself, Brian, and your team around understanding what is happening right now. So there's a lot of reliance on on data um, and also narrative data as well. So that dialogue, mm. we've got to keep that going. So it, it, this is this is not something where there will become an end point. We really want to weave this into the culture and yeah. the way that we operate within the organisation. Um, so the key thing for us is about making the support accessible and available absolutely all of the time. Um, will there be sticky moments from a leadership perspective, an individual perspective? Will people find it difficult and uncomfortable? Absolutely. Um, but that's part of the learning journey, I, I think, for, for us as an organisation. And that's where the guardrails come in. So that's social learning and um, working with expertise so that actually we, we we're informed and we can normalize the conversation that's one of the key things that i think we we will be keeping focused on from an organizational perspective normalizing the conversation about psychological health health and that in itself i've definitely found this it, it makes you feel more confident talking about it and then it becomes embedded yeah Lovely. I, I think just picking up on that, I think I think that links very nicely to what you were saying earlier about being a mum. And I think, you know, when when we're in these situations, because no one talks about it, you think, well, is it just me who can't, you know, who isn't coping perfectly with this new new offspring? And, and I think the same is true with feeling stressed or anxious. And this links into a huge area of psychology that you and I have talked about, which is that when we get stressed, we then think I shouldn't feel like this. I should be able to cope. Other people are, are coping. Why aren't I coping? I'm pathetic. I'm letting people down. People will notice. I'll lose my job. What we then do is we get stressed about being stressed, which makes us uber stressed. And that feeds the monster. And I think what you were saying a moment ago about psychological education, normalization, it's not just me. It's normal as a human being to feel stressed, to feel anxious, to feel low, to feel shame. But what can we do to mitigate it? How can we bounce back from it? So I think that's that's really key. Yeah. There's something on that, Ryan, as well, which I think is, is really important, and you have mentioned it, is 
whilst we're, we're gathering the data and, and the insights, and that will be really, really valuable as a, as a bit of a checkpoint for us, helps us to identify the hotspots and the themes that we, we really want to put a focus on across the organisation. The other thing I think is really important is having that sponsorship. So we have got executive board sponsorship at Erwin Mitchell for this, this programme, and that in itself has helped to create those social norms. Okay, so, and, and actually to, what we've done is our executive board have, have been through a programme of learning and are talking very openly about that and the power of that is phenomenal um yeah. you know so it, it again it makes it very clear that we are committed to this at an organizational level and our experiences of, as human beings are very similar regardless of our role absolutely yeah so, yeah. yeah okay so as we uh as we look to the future then brian um what steps do you think that individuals leaders and organizations should be taking to protect and promote their psychological health over and above i guess what we've just been talking through well i think i think it just summarizes a lot of the things that we touched on i think on at an individual level i think your point about normalization understanding when, when you're a young mom and you talk to other young moms you discover that we're all having this i think that point about normalization is so powerful for destigmatizing. Uh, so I think if one can use psychological education to normalize, but then create what we talk about is emotional literacy, because emotions are very powerful at driving how we think, feel and behave. And they're very sticky, particularly negative emotions like anger, fear, sadness, shame, guilt. We can get stuck in those uh sort of loops very very quickly and we need to so emotional literacy informs emotional regulation which then informs a personal resilience framework i think for leaders it's talking the talk valuing it but walking the talk but also being transparent and honest and authentic about valuing it recognizing it and rewarding it so calling it out when it's done and when it isn't done and if that's a cultural display rule, that makes a huge difference. And then I think, you know, building that healthy cooperative uh, environment, it's not going to eliminate psychological distress, but it's going to massively mitigate it, which is fantastic. And just on that, actually, Brian, we've just had a question come in. Um, so for organisations who are more hierarchical, perhaps dated, how do you move the concept of social connections? Um, I guess that's trying to shift that 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 dial a little bit in those organisations where actually social connections aren't perhaps as open as what they are in some organisations. So any any advice on that one? Well, this is very interesting because I think with AI coming around the corner, um, there's a lot of work. I mean, Suskind at uh, Oxford has done a huge amount of work on this, and this is going to bring exponential change into our world, both at work and outside of work. I think what's been shown by Sandy Pentland, who's a professor at MIT, is he's he's he he calls it social physics. And he has shown with fantastic, I mean, with gigabytes of data that how people relate to each other uh, predicts the success of the organization. And he talks about collective intelligence and idea flow. And one of the things that um, computers will be able to do and AI will be able to do. There's lots of things that we haven't been able to do, but as well as, and they will do it better than us. But there's a very powerful process that occurs through social connection and that collective knowledge. And what happens with hierarchical organizations, and, and this is something that Pentland talks about a lot, is you often create echo chambers. So what happens is at the top of the organization, you have a little cabal or a little clique of people who say, oh, no, no, I completely agree with you. No, I agree with you too. No, no, you're absolutely right. You need people who question you, particularly now. And we need to get, and he argues, the more people you have involved where you can share ideas, that you have psychological safety, you can speak up, you can inform, those are the organizations that are going to get the inside track. And if you look at organizations like, you know, Kodak, who didn't believe digital would take over from the family album, uh, and they, their, their, their board meetings were minuted saying that. Um, you have to have somebody saying, hang on, mate, 
it will it will replace the family emblem get digital so i think the danger with hierarchy is we think we have a monopoly of knowledge and power and control i think if you can create a more collective intelligence with creative abrasion and idea flow and pentland talks about idea flow a lot that is going to equip you to survive what is going to be a bumpy old ride almost creating that opportunity to demonstrate the impact of having that trusted collaborative environment and, yep. and i guess that goes yep. back to the point around leadership doesn't it you know we we've been really clear at owen mitchell about that what our framework of expectations are around leadership behaviors for example and there's there's, there's that creates that expectation and that those guide rails as to what mm. really collaborative open strategic uh, leadership looks like okay good just one one final question then then well two actually but just on the topic of data we've I've alluded to what we're doing with the knowing mitchell working with yourselves brian but i just wanted to ask your view on the importance of measuring psychological health and actually how does that then help inform the strategy moving forward well i'm going to use a medical example i think if you pitch up you know, for a Bupa medical, a lot of us pitch up for medicals and we think there's nothing the matter with us. And then someone tells us your cholesterol's up or your blood pressure's up. I think this is really important because it then gives you information that you can then target. Um, I think the danger of not knowing is you don't know what you don't know, so you don't do anything. I think once I know my blood pressure's up or I have a high cholesterol, there are certain things that are in my gift that I can do to mitigate that. I think a lot of us a bit ostrich like some organizations don't want the data because they don't want to hear what people are thinking because it frightens them i think the i think it comes back to that thing about what gets measured gets managed but also for that organization that really really value uh, a collaborative collegiate environment but they don't measure it so if they don't measure it they don't know which bits of the organization are doing it brilliantly and which bits are not doing it so brilliantly because then you can help people who are not doing it so brilliantly become better at it so uh, it's not about calling people out or punishing people it's about just understanding where the hot spots are and where you can intervene to make things better and actually that, that's the point around trust isn't it it's about how we use that data it's absolutely there's going to be no repercussions for anybody it's for genuinely positive intentions and that helps to reinforce that that environment of talk to us help us to understand and then we can we can work with you that's absolutely key yeah okie dokie then just just final question from me then uh brian before we wrap up if you could pick just one thing that organizations should focus on looking at managing in terms of psychological well-being for their people in the future as we emerge into we've managed to go nearly an hour without saying the new normal but i'm going to say it so what would what would that one thing be from from your perspective well i think i think for me it's going to be a new different it's not going to be a new normal and i think it'll be a constant new different and i think that tolerance of uncertainty is key i'm going to be I'm get, it's a bit like desert island discs i'm going to ask for two things um to take to my desert island i i'd like i i think i would it, psychological education is key for normalization reducing stigma and shame and giving people access to tools and techniques that can make a huge difference but the second thing is i think creating social support collaborative collegiate affiliative supportive groups and i think if organizations do those two things they will shift the dial and from my experience i couldn't agree with you more you know the combination of those two things along with the data real, real impact and longevity so thank you okay so just um time for me to to wrap up so thank you for those of you that have taken the time to join us um on this friday afternoon and i hope you found that that conversation useful and insightful we will be um able to post a recording afterwards um, I would encourage you as well, if you're not following um, the positive group on LinkedIn to do so, because I know that Dr. Brian and his team post many similar brilliant conversations on there regularly. I know that I definitely do dip into those and uh, listen with real interest.
So thank you for your time. Thank you as ever to you, Dr. Brian, and have a great weekend, weekend when it arrives, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.